You know it's Christmas season when you start hearing the music of Christmas being played everywhere. Well, the songs of Christmas are not just something that date to our present era, they actually go back 2,000 years. And in this short mini-series, we're gonna be tackling the original songs of Christmas, beginning with Mary's song, or as many of you know it, the Magnificat. So here we go. Well, we are in the season of Advent leading up to Christmas. And when we think of Christmas, hopefully the first thing we're thinking about is Jesus, right? Reason for the season. But with Christmas comes parties and presents and lights and all kinds of fun festivities. But always connected to Christmas has been music, songs. Uh, what's, what's your favorite Christmas album? Uh, my favorite album is Amy Grant's A Christmas Album, and the very first track is called A Tennessee Christmas. And I remember growing up in Michigan, listening to this song about a Tennessee Christmas, and I just love the entire album. And now having lived in the Nashville area for the last seven years, like this album is even more meaningful to me now than it was even growing up. So you've got music connected to Christmas. And so we were thinking it'd be really fun to do a short series on the songs of Christmas, but they're not just songs, they're, they're proclamations. They are prophetic words that are just laced in power. And so we're gonna begin with Mary's song. Uh, many of you actually know it as the Magnificat, which is Latin for the first word, then the translation of Mary's first line, and it's connected to this word magnifies in English. That's what it means in Latin. And so she begins with, my soul magnifies the Lord, and it just sets the stage for the entire Magnificat. Now we're gonna come back to the rest of this in just a bit, but what I wanna do is provide some context for the Magnificat. We always do this here at Walking the Text, is look at the text through various lenses of context. And one of the most significant ones for us today in this episode is the historical lens, the historical backdrop to the Magnificat. And so let's just begin back in Israelite history which in many ways really got some speed after God rescued and redeemed them from Egypt. And they eventually established a monarchy in the Promised Land, and then after Solomon, that monarchy divides. And the kingdom in the north is called Israel, the one in the south is called Judah, and the northern kingdom gets taken out by Assyria. About 150 years later, the southern kingdom gets taken out by Babylon. Uh, and then shortly after that, the Persians knock off the Babylonians. They allow the Israelites to return to the land, but they're still ruled by the Persians. And then a couple hundred years later, the Greeks knock off the Persians. And then eventually, when we come to the end of our first century BC, we have Rome is on the scene. Now, aside from a short, roughly 80-year window of autonomy because of the Maccabean Revolt, Israel has been subjected to some foreign pagan oppressive empire. And the people in Mary's day are longing for God to act because God had made promises throughout their scriptures. Uh, most notably, it began in 2 Samuel chapter 7 when God through the prophet Nathan says this to David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it begins with these promises to David about an everlasting kingdom. And so you see this theme playing out in the rest of the scriptures among the prophets, and I just wanna highlight two key passages. One of those passages we read during the Christmas season. It's from Isaiah chapter nine. Notice verses six and seven. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 
And then another significant passage happens in the book of Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and Daniel interprets the dream. And in the midst of the interpretation, Daniel says this in chapter 2, verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. And in the context of what's happening in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it actually begins with Babylon and it talks about the four nations that will rise that includes Babylon, which means Rome is that fourth kingdom. And so there is anticipation at the end of the first century BC of the people longing for God to act through the promises that he made beginning with Daniel. And you can even go all the way back to Genesis 12 and Abraham. But when it talks about a kingdom that will last forever, it began in 2 Samuel 7, and you see Daniel talking about it. And it's like the Romans have been on the scene in the land of Israel now for six decades. Is it now where God is going to act? And that provides our historical backdrop to the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. Notice Luke 1, 26 and following. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. <laughs> and the virgin's name was Mary. So already we get, we're dealing with the house of David, and that is significant. Now, just real quick, because the text has already given this to us, it mentions that Mary is a virgin betrothed to Joseph. Now, the betrothal period is similar to what it would be like an engagement for us, only it's got more legal ramifications. So in the ancient world, you would have a betrothal period and then the actual wedding, and those two together would mean that you are married in the sense that we understand today. But a betrothal period also meant that legally you're married, you just didn't come together yet to consummate the marriage. That is where Mary is in the process with Joseph. And what we know of the ancient world is that it was generally between the ages of 13 and 15 that a girl was betrothed. The guy was usually around 18 years old. So this is, this is likely the age that Mary is. She's 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. And if you want more of a backdrop on, on that and the relationship with Joseph and the implications of that, we went in greater detail in episode 157, Brad Nelson did, on Mary. But notice how this continues with the angel Gabriel. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of a greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Okay, hold that favor piece. It's now shown up twice. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And hopefully your radar is going off because all of these phrases here connect back to the passages that we just looked at. And they're firing for Mary as well. And what we're going to see is that she is just going to explode with excitement. Uh, now, let me just ask you this question. What causes you to explode with excitement? Uh, maybe it's your favorite football team, you know, getting a touchdown in the very last second to win the game, and you just erupt in excitement. Or for others of you, it's the, the other football, and you've got Messi bending a shot around the wall, putting it up in the upper 90, and all of a sudden you leap up going, I can't believe this happened. Or maybe you're at the concert of your favorite band and you hear the first note of your favorite song and your excitement just wells up and explodes with joy. That's exactly what's happening with the Magnificat. 
This is what's happening inside of Mary. It's like all of these things are coming together and she just explodes in excitement and joy. And what comes out of her? The Magnificat. So let's read these words knowing that it's actually a song, a proclamation of all of these things coming together. And we read this, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. That is a powerful song right there. And it is not passive like whatsoever. Like it is laced in confidence. It is laced in power. It is laced in belief and hope and just God now is the time and you have been faithful and you are faithful and you're doing something and it's happening now in my belly. And there is just joy on the scene. Now I love what Scott McKnight says about the Mary that we are encountering here. Because oftentimes we kind of get this, this kind of sheepish, passive, like in the background, you know, porcelain Mary. And that's not how Scott sees it. And it's not how I see it either. And I love how he put this in his book, The Real Mary. Mary was not a quote unquote nice girl. Mary was a muscular, wiry woman whose eyes were aglow with a dazzling hope for justice and whose body evoked a robust confidence in the God who was about to turn the world upside down through her son. And this is why that in the midst of what comes out of Mary in the Magnificat, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and pastor who was murdered by the Nazis, said this about the Magnificat. The Magnificat is the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. And when you recognize that and you go back over the lyrics of Mary's song, you go, where in the world did she conjure up such language for such a hymn? And the answer is her Bible, the Hebrew scriptures that when you line up her words in the Magnificat and you look for direct quotations or strong allusions, you have passages from all throughout the Older Testament. In fact, here are just 15 of them. There are more. And if you want something fun, continue your study by going to 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 10 and compare Mary's song with Hannah's prayer and you're gonna see a ton of connections just in this passage alone. But Mary knew her scriptures. She had hidden God's word in her heart, and at the moment of exuberant joy, what bursts forth? The very words of God in a powerful proclamation. Now here's what Paul Wright says about her usage of the biblical text. He says, Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat, is a wonderful composition that draws on themes and phrases from great men and women, psalmists and prophets of the Old Testament. The song shows that in spite of her gender and tender years, Mary was steeped in the Hebrew scriptures and synagogue liturgies. You better believe she was. And when all of that came together, you have in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the most powerful hymn ever composed. Just last week, my wife and I had the privilege of being in Washington, D.C. for a number of days and for a number of events. And on the very first night we were there, we were at a dinner, and at the very end, the MC got up, and he said, hey, we're gonna close out our night together with a couple of songs of worship. 
and we want to provide a very special guest to you. And I'm thinking it could be a number of different people that are really well known. And he said, her name is Mary Kate and she's 14 years old. And it's like, Mary Kate, we have a Mary on the scene who is 14 years old. And I'm thinking, who is this? And then they gave her last name and I was like, oh yes, that's a very well-known last name in the Washington DC area. I can see why she's being asked to do this. And I almost kind of like downplayed a little bit. She's getting up there because of her name. And then the MC said, literally right after this, uh, in the event that you think she's just up here because of her last name, I think you're gonna think otherwise after you experience what comes next. And this 14 year old girl walks up there and she had just turned 14 the day before. And she's got a keyboard and she just starts in to song. And it was like the first note that came out of her mouth. It's like the aura of the room changed. I turned to my wife and I was like, what is happening right now? Because it was like an infusion of the Holy Spirit in the room. And all of a sudden, this young, tender, 14-year-old girl starts to sing and it is like the walls are shaking in this place. And as I am brought to just awe and reverence of who God is through her leading, I am standing there singing and processing at the same time and going, here is someone who loves Jesus, who has an amazing gift, who has been steeped in scripture. I know that about her family heritage. And what's happening in these moments, you can't even put language to. Two days later, she got to sing uh, a duet with Ed Cash. And when Ed Cash was introducing her to the audience, he was so giddy on stage that he was gonna get to do this song with Mary Kate. And it was at that moment where I realized Mary Kate was youth, scriptures, belief, favor of God, and song. And when all of these came together, there was just an explosion of God's presence and spirit. And this is what Mary Kate has. I mean, you can't fake favor. She has the favor of God. She has an anointing. She is youthful. She is energetic. She loves the word of God. She has a belief in who Jesus Christ is, and she knows how to put together a song. Friends, this is Mary 2,000 years ago with the greatest song ever composed. This is the Magnificat. This is all of the hopes and dreams of all the years being met in Jesus Christ and Mary being the one who is going to bear this son. And central to what Mary has is the sense of belief. And I love the passage that precedes the Magnificat that we haven't looked at yet. And it's actually a theme that's already shown up a couple of times in Luke chapter one. But let me just give you one verse. Elizabeth is speaking to Mary and she says, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Mary believed it in her bones that God was moving that God was working and that God was doing something spectacular. Now, yes, she was visited by an angel, okay? I get that. But Gabriel wasn't working from nothing. He was working with this woman, this girl, who had a maturity beyond her years, who had a belief in God, who knew his scriptures, who was hopeful and anticipating and the moment that she was told the time is now, she's like, I've got some language for that. Here we go. And I would just say that in this moment we see that Mary was blessed for believing. And friends, this is also true for us as well. That when we recognize that Christmas, the Advent season, is a time where we not only recall that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, we are believing that he is coming again. And that between these two comings, he's present and active in the world right now. And that he's inviting us daily to partner with him 
in the very things that he is wanting to do in the world today. And the question he has is, do you believe it enough to join me? Because belief isn't just a passive thing. Belief, when it is fully rooted, turns into action. And that when we recognize that this is a season where we celebrate that Jesus came and that Jesus will come again, the question becomes for us is how can we believe this story to such a depth that not only do we experience the blessing of it, we do something about it because it is in doing that we also experience the blessing of believing. This is what Mary had in her bones 2000 years ago. And it's what Jesus is looking for in his followers today. So may you be blessed for believing and may we continue to hope and dream and participate in this world in a way that God's kingdom continues to advance. So friends, there you go. Proclamations of Christmas, part one. As we always say here at Walking the Text, may you not just hear these words, may you live these words. And the biblical word for live is to walk. So may you walk out these words well in your life.